This is Jay Rogers. I am the director of The Forerunner. And in this video, I want to look at a book that I just recently published. It's called The Fourth Political Theory and Biblical Perspective. If you want to check it out, the easiest way is just to go to Amazon. And uh, Amazon is here. Let me just pull the screen up here. And all you have to do is type in my name, Jay Rogers. I'll put the link down below, but you can see this fairly easily. And you'll see a list of all of my books on Amazon. Here are some of them here down below. Um, this one is not, obviously. That's another person named Jay Rogers that has a title in a book. But everything down to here, these are different books that I have available. But this is the most recent one. And it says, um, a Christian civilization is emerging from under the chaos that has been strewn throughout the wreckage of modern culture. As dawn breaks through the darkness, many will be awakened to a new understanding of the fulfillment of the law through love and grace. Many will comprehend, as if for the first time, what it means to be truly human. We are being prepared to overcome a world system that has denied God, faith, family, and even humanity itself. And so what this book is, it's a summary and critique of leading experts in the theory of a rising multipolar world, including The Changing World Order by Ray Dalio, Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington, and The Fourth Political Theory by Alexander Dugin, or Alexander Dugin. A timely and insightful analysis of the tectonic shift in global politics, this book explains why a renewed Christian civilization may not be so far away. Those are my anonymous uh, reviewers there. So this is um, my diagram of the fourth political theory. Now what this symbol is here, this is called the symbol of chaos. There was a science fiction writer that wrote this novel series uh, called The Eternal Champion. Michael Moorcroft is his name if you want to look it up. And he had a symbol, which is basically um, arrows going in a radial pattern. And the idea was each universe has its own law. But it, for the hero, it was, uh, you know, this is a symbol of chaos because the, the, the arrows are going in all different directions. And so what I was able to find going on the Internet is that people um, have used this circle to try to describe what the fourth political theory is. Um, on the bottom, you have the fourth political theory. It's essentially anti-liberalism. It's anti-modernity. It's against uh, the unipolar world and for the multipolar world. And there's also the idea of um, continental continentalism, or what Dugan calls Eurasianism, which is not a geopolitical uh, boundary, but it's more of like a, a philosophy. Like Eurasianism is a philosophy. It's not saying that uh, you know there should be a a power in your well anyway so anyway and then does sign which is a, a concept that martin heidegger and so on the periphery um is are these different um movements that have come out of um, political theories there's liberalism which is the zone of liberal domination there's communism and then there's fascism so the first political theory the second political theory uh, the third political theory, and then the fourth political theory is what's emerging in the world right now. And it isn't any one of these, but it's whatever the culture in that society uh, chooses, to, chooses to use in order to order its own politics, society, culture, that type of thing. Many of these uh, orders are what we would call pre-modern. So this is, what, this is how I have it here. We have, again, the three political theories, liberalism, communism, and fascism. Uh, I put communism on the left, fascism on the right. And then down below is the idea of human beings in the world, which is Heidegger's concept of Dasein. And the idea is, is that we are thrown into the world in the context of our uh, shared history, our religion, our ritual, our customs, our traditions, culture, ethics, and moral values. That is That was the organizing principle or the logos for societies up until about the modern age. And then in the in a Christian society, I have a, some, that's what we're looking for since we're in a Christian culture. Uh, we have God as the, the logos or Jesus Christ as the logos. And then the family, the church, the cultural institutions, and the civil government, different spheres that would govern our lives. There's different politics there, but it's not, a, it's not a centrally organized political system around liberalism. It would be local, and it would be um, 
run by God's law. So one law for all people in our in our culture. But what we have today is we have the first um, fascism failed. It failed after World War II. Then communism failed after 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And even countries like China today that go by like the Communist Party name, they still are more like command capitalist with some socialism, kind of like a, a third way type of a thing. So there really aren't any large communist uh, blocks in the world today like there were prior to 1991. So what we're left with is liberalism. And some of the characters, caricatures that have spun off of um, fascism are things like white supremacy, ultranationalism, neo-Nazism, neo-fascism. Uh, you have like these really bizarre type of cults like, you know, BDSM. I won't go into that too much. And in Ukraine and Russia, they have like the Azov militia, the right sector, which are these neo-Nazi um, military organizations that have risen up. And then we have right wing. Right wing populism doesn't really belong to fascism, but it's a right wing movement that doesn't really have a political theory. It's just against elitism, but it's not really grounded in any one thing like you know Christian culture or something like that. And on the left, we, so that would be people like uh, right wing populist obviously Donald Trump and then on the left wing we have um, people like um, Bernie Sanders um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and people like that on the left probably probably Harris too we haven't seen what she would do yet but and so what's left in the wreckage of communism is uh, cultural Marxism which is a, another name for the social justice movement and all the different neo-Marxist movements like liberation theology uh, then we have socialism socialism could be um, fascistic, it could be liberal, but we usually in America we associate socialism as like a midway to communism. Anything that's based on dialectical materialism and then different uh, movements on the left wing, uh, like you know, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, obviously, Antifa is anti fascism, so it would be over here. And then up here, I have you know, there be monsters here. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that what we call liberalism today is really post liberalism okay it's it's liberalism is one system that won out over the other two political theories but because of the fact that it doesn't have a contender it doesn't have a uh, any type of a challenger it's gone into this postmodern version where this is the you have all these choices now but really there's only one choice which is to be postmodern and to be post liberal and within that we have things like post structuralism Neoconservatism and neoliberalism are both forms of liberalism, and a lot of conservatives don't get that. Uh, it's a very common understanding in other parts of the world. Like if you were to go to talk to um, Millet in Argentina, who just won the election, he constantly refers to himself as a liberal. But what he means by that is he's a classical liberal, like a libertarian. So libertarianism would be uh, classical conservatism. But then we have neoconservatism, which is just kind of like a pro-war a uh, pro-capitalist form of liberalism, and it believes in, in big government, lots of spending, things like that. And then neoliberalism is kind of like a right center liberalism that believes in most of the same things as neoconservatism. There's not really that much difference between the two, but I describe it in the book. The whole thing with um, LGBT and transgenderism is part of that, that scary monster time that we're in right now, um, as well as post-humanism, which would come in uh, with AI and things like that, and then transhumanism. If there really is a transhumanist movement where people want to augment human beings with machines and genetic um, experimentation and things like that. Okay, so that's that's basically what the book's about. Specifically, what I do is I begin with Ray Dalio. I'm just going to take about two or three minutes and cover each one of these. Um, let me get out of the this right here okay so this is ray dalio's book it's called the changing world order why nations succeed and fail and i really recommend this book it's got lots of nice um oops has lots of nice graphs and charts in it to kind of explain it i did not study finance or economics when i was in school um and i found that reading this book i probably learned more about finance and economics than I learned just through reading newspapers and listening to the news and things like that. Essentially what Ray Dalio says is that 
if you go back through the fi past 500 years of modernism, which started with the Portuguese exploration of America and vast amounts of wealth that came in into the into Europe from the New World and other countries, um, you have the first world currency empires. And the world currency empires follow a predictable pattern that lasts about 80 to 100 years. First, there were the Portuguese, then the Spanish, followed by the Dutch. And the Dutch started with the Dutch basically in, invented investment capitalism. Uh, free market forces have been around since the beginning of time, and people have been able to reinvest their capital into their uh, their business or their farm or whatever and make money. You see that in the Bible, and you see that in ancient histories. But investment capitalism was that you could buy a piece of stock in this government run, this company that essentially become the government of, of the Netherlands which was the Dutch East India Company. And then from there, that profit from that investment was invested in all kinds of other things. So the Dutch had their golden age. It lasted about 80 to 100 years, and it suddenly crashed after a war. Uh, then we had the French that went up to about the time of, of Napoleon. And then the British took over with their own British East India Company, and they rose to huge heights. After World War I, their economy crashed, and America was dubbed the successor state. Now, Dalio's idea is that there's about six major stages of this world currency empire, and America is at stage five or stage six. And so if you think that the world seems like it's very crazy right now, and you think that uh, our country is in trouble, that we're kind of entering this crisis stage, Dalio explains exactly why from an economic standpoint. And he goes beyond economics and talks about social forces and things like that as well. But... The idea is that we're getting ready for another uh, another currency empire to replace us. And my idea, he thinks it's China. My idea is that it will be BRICS, which is not not just one country replacing uh, the United States power over the currency in the whole world, but a multipolar system in which there would be a shared currency and nations would be able to have like more of a fair trade world order. But that's in the book. The second book is called, um, so I, I go through this book in detail. Uh, I summarize each one of the sections pretty fairly thoroughly. Now, I don't cover everything, but just like the main ideas. And then I interpret it, and then I have a section where I um, kind of evaluate and analyze it more from a biblical perspective, like what's about tithing and Sabbath rests. And he has an interesting concept called the Jubilee Year. He actually says that nations ought to ought to rest and reset their economy after the 50th year. He actually says that in the book. He's not a Christian, but he sees that principle. If you don't do that, then the economy gets into trouble. So that, I found that interesting. This is called Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington. And Samuel Huntington is has influenced numerous people. Uh, his idea was that prior to 1991, there was a bipolar world order. And now we're in a unipolar world order. But he says that the unipolar world order will probably give way to a multipolar world of civilization states. And so I look at that and then I analyze like, you know, what's a nation biblically? Like, what do we mean when we say the nation? It's not A nation's not a geopolitical entity in the Bible, it's a people. And so the idea is, is that maybe um, God wants the world to move back into this uh, into this thing where we're a little bit more like tribal and ethnic oriented, not ethnic, um, you know, genetic ethics, but cultural, culturally a people, like a, a people culture, okay? Uh, and one of the examples that he gives in the book is that the Chinese don't call their country a nation, they call it a nation family. You know, their religion isn't Confucianism, it's a Confucian family. So everything is based around the family, everything is based around community and then the community expands outward until you have a nation and then a civilization state is a conglomeration of nations and they can be separate nations geopolitically but they all have a common cultural core so they act together as a civilization and he's saying that's the way that things have been through most of world history and we're headed back in that direction okay and the final book is called um the fourth political theory, and I spend time. This is, book is a little bit more difficult. It's not that thick, but it's a lot of dense philosophy. And Dugan is very controversial, mainly because I think people don't understand him that well. But he's a Huntingtonite. He follows Samuel Huntington's idea of 
civilization states and multipolarism. But for Dugan, he's more interested in the philosophy. Like he goes back to like, you know, Plato and uh, the, uh, the modern philosophers. Then he looks at the anti-modern philosophers, like people like Heidegger and so on, people who saw that modernism is flawed because it is anti, like all these things here that we went over. Let me just pull this up so I can explain it a little bit better. Um, this is, you know, modernism does away with it's anti-history, it's anti-religion, anti-ritual, anti-custom, anti-tradition, anti-cultural, anti-ethics, anti-moral values, and it replaces them with its own version of that. Okay, so you're, that, that's why we have all of this nonsense going on up here. This is the attempt to replace the traditional family, the traditional church, the traditional cultural institutions, limited self-government with, with this world right here. And so Dugan talks about, he starts with um, Samuel Huntington's idea of there's a nation state, which is more liberal, but then the civilization state, which is more, um, I don't want to say conservative, although conservatives would probably agree with the civilization state, but it's more like coming from the populace. It's, it's populist and it's also traditional. Okay, so the civilization state is this pre-modern logos, but... Dugan says we need to not just go back to the pre-modern, but push through postmodernism and discover what the fourth political theory is. And so it might be different for each each nation and each culture. He also talks about the difference between freedom from and freedom to. Freedom to is the government that exists just to secure some basic freedoms, and people are free to be human and be uh you know, be connected to their family and their church and things like that. Freedom from would be the government tries to really control who has civil rights and who doesn't. Okay, so, for instance, in a freedom to, you would have freedom of religion. And freedom from is you have freedom from religion, where we have to make sure that religion is not in public schools, it's not in the, in the civil sphere. And, and it's a lot more pervasive than you realize when you get into looking at that. It's not just, um, you know, religion, but it's other things. The fourth political theory is multipolar, and then liberalism is unipolar. In other words, there's just one liberal world order. It's based on the United States and Europe system, and that's imposed on the rest of the world. And then the fourth political theory is traditional, and then the liberal system is postmodernist. And postmodernism has gone beyond modernism into this crisis stage, which is described up here. So that's the book. Um, I encourage you to go to Amazon, check it out, and I'll have a cheaper version that's, um, you know, less than half price. That's, that's a digital version very soon. Thank you for watching.